Look, I want to move on now to uh, another issue and a big important global issue, the war in Ukraine. And as you know, a couple of weeks ago, the ambassador from Ukraine based in Canberra was out here and the government committed to sending 150 or so New Zealand troops to Britain to help train uh, Ukrainian infantry folk, infantry people, infantry men, uh, soldiers. Let's go soldiers, that's a gender neutral uh, term. Uh, and I was surprised because at the same time, um, the Ukrainians wanted light armoured vehicles, and we have them. Ours are called light armoured vehicles, LAVs. And I actually went to the press conference and I asked the Prime Minister deliberately, are we still considering that? And the clear answer I got from Penny Hinari, who was there, the Minister of Defence and the Prime Minister, was no. We don't have spare parts, our LAVs aren't suitable and we're not going to give the Ukrainians that hardware for their troops who are literally fighting a shooting war in their home country. I thought that was curious, and I thought given that was the one thing that the Ukrainians had asked for, it was worth going back to them and asking them what their view of our government's position was. Uh, so last night uh, I got on the blower um, to the ambassador from Ukraine to Australia and New Zealand in Canberra. Ambassador Marashenko, you've visited New Zealand uh, recently and clearly your country still under attack, still at war. Were you satisfied with the response of the New Zealand government to your calls for help? Yes, I'm satisfied with the response. Um, just as I was visiting Ukraine, and New Zealand has announced a new batch of assistance, which included 120 uh, soldiers from New Zealand who have, are departing to the UK, and they will uh, conduct trainings for the Ukrainian uh, soldiers out there, and they will train eventually together with the British about 10,000 of, of new recruits or recent recruits. Uh, who will be able to join the, the Ukrainian uh, Defence Forces and to be able to fight. What um, Ambassador Miroshenko told me was that we didn't get... He did not get a hard no from the government on the LAVs. And the reason I was given by the government for the uh, LAV uh, refusal was that they are, well, unsuitable, unsuitable for the theatre and there weren't enough spare parts. Well, the ambassador came back to me and said, that's funny because the Canadians and the British are giving us LAVs, which we're going to use. They have plenty of spare parts and we still want them. We still want them. We could use them to transport our troops up to the front line. They do have armament with them and we are more than happy to be responsible for the spare parts, for the maintenance or the recommissioning of these vehicles. So the question remains, and I understand we've got at least 20 spare labs, why aren't we giving them to the Ukrainians? And why did the government not tell the truth? Uh, any government requires a cabinet meeting and it has to be a cabinet decision. Uh, so uh, I understand uh, the requests which were coming uh, were not yet met and, uh, and, and, and I hope that the government of New Zealand will, will have another sitting out there and we'll see what they can what they can do. If they some of those vehicles, if they are not in good shape, I'm sure we can fix them. So we'd be happy to take them. So yes, uh, uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian people could and Ukrainian soldiers could benefit from that equipment. So I really hope that New Zealand will eventually provide them, uh, but may, may not maybe at at the moment. That uh, I'm, I'm I remain hopeful. Um. I have to say, I, I directly at a press conference asked the Minister of Defence and the Prime Minister if they had made a decision, and I'm sorry, Ambassador, they gave me and other journalists the clear impression that they believed that our light armoured vehicles, that there weren't enough spare parts, that the Ukrainian military would not be able to maintain them or service them properly, and it simply was not on the table. Is this not what you have been told? Look, we've had different discussions. We discussed different topics. And uh, speaking on, on spare parts, these are British vehicles. Uh, they were made by the UK uh, or Canada. Uh, we, we need to check. It could be a British company making them in Canada. And we, we have very good relations with both Canada and, and the UK uh, who have similar equipment and who have similar light armored vehicles. 
and I'm sure we could we could find the spare parts and and get the maintenance we need uh, for for those vehicles. So yes, uh, I believe we we could still make use of those. Uh, so I hope maybe uh, New Zealand will revisit that. But look, it's not up to me to decide. Um, uh, we are out there fighting the the war, and the war is brutal. Uh, the number of casualties are very high. Russians. Uh, you know, we outnumbered, we out, we outgunned. Uh, so we need to get whatever we can. And mm. certainly, I'm very thankful to what New Zealand has provided so far. Mm. It's just that this war is going on, and it's still at a very um, high intensity. Uh, so, so we need the kit, we need the guns, uh, we need we need the tanks and the jets, and um, and we need long range missiles, and we need air defense systems. And of course, uh, New Zealand does not have all of that. That whatever New Zealand has, we'd make use to make use of it for mm. sure. Uh, a- Ambassador, it is hard this far away from the actual conflict from your home country. In some ways, to think of this conflict in personal terms as real, but it most certainly is a very real shooting war. Uh, people are dying, losing their homes, their livelihoods. Uh, and there is huge risk there, the risk of the nuclear plants getting out of control, um, the death of, of civilians, the death of anyone in a war. I think it would be fair to say that many have been surprised at the resilience of Ukraine in the face of this aggression. Uh, but how long can you realistically hold out with the current levels of support and facing the level of aggression from the Soviet, uh, from Russia, I should say. Look, Ukraine's resistance and resilience comes from the fact that we've had this war for eight years. Russia invaded us eight years ago, and uh, we've had many people who've gone through combat. The society has built up the resilience to be able to defend ourselves. So all those predictions that Kiev would fall in three days uh, didn't come true. We were able to fight, we're able to demonstrate that we are capable of defending the country. And uh, if making a comparison about the resilience, um, I always make a comparison of a beehive. Ukraine is, as you know, is the largest producer of honey in Europe. And while New Zealand is the largest producer of honey in the world, uh, we have many beekeepers. And uh, thinking of, of bees in a beehive, it's a horizontal structure. Every bee knows what he or she is doing. And, and once uh, the bear came, uh, they all got united and they're all fighting the enemy. And the entire Ukrainian society is now united to, to defeat the Russians. And everybody is participating one on one or another. Farmers are stealing tractors. People with disabilities are making Molotov cocktails. People, volunteers are raising money and delivering food uh, to the front lines. Uh, the whole society is all geared towards this war. And everybody is 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 making a contribution. So that's that's our how long that's going to last. Nobody knows. Uh, well, it all depends on the Russians because they need to stop and they need to withdraw from Ukraine entirely, including Crimea. And we need to restore the sovereignty. And this is when the war will end. Mm. I guess, and I know this sounds uh, uh, maybe heartless. The good thing is that apart from those who are invading you, the Russians, um, you are fighting this war in terms of people and boots on the ground on your own. And I guess that means whenever it is over, Ukrainians still have their country. You are not occupied in, in any way. Absolutely. Look, we need to repel the Russians and to free the people of Ukraine from the Russian uh, occupation because there are some... Uh, serious uh, uh, Russian war crimes and crimes against humanity which are perpetrated by the Russians on the occupied territories. So to stop that, we need to repel them and keep them out of Ukraine. Mm. Would it also be fair to say that this is Putin's war? It is the military in Russia that are waging this war, not necessarily the Russian people. And how do Ukrainians, the everyday Ukrainian and the everyday Russian, see each other? Look, uh, this war is supported by the majority of the Russian people. 80% of them uh, support the invasion. 
actually many Russians believe that Putin is too weak on Ukraine because he should use all the weapons he's got, oh, including man. the tactical nuclear weapons against Ukraine. So uh, the Russian people are responsible for the war crimes in Ukraine. The Russian people are all responsible for what's happening in Ukraine. And it's not just Putin, it's just the entire Russian population will have to bear the price, pay the price uh, for what they've done. And this is like Nazi Germany. It was the entire German nation which had to be re-educated. And this is what needs to happen to Russia. The problem is how do we re-educate a nuclear power? That makes it a bit complicated, right? So it's the entire Russian population which is responsible. And Ukrainians will not forgive the Russians for what they've done in Ukraine. Uh, maybe in two, two, two generations from now, but everything will depend on what how Russia is going to look like then. Mm. What are your realistic hopes as a Ukrainian, as an individual, for when this I'm, might I'm, end? I remain optimistic. I remain optimistic. I'm out there waking up every morning. What else can I do for my country while my people are down there in the trenches fighting? So it gives me a great deal of inspiration and, and strength to continue advocating for Ukraine, to continue securing more military assistance from New Zealand and from Australia. And that's what I'm doing. Look, that's my job. Wow. And, uh, and I'm out there. That's my, that's my war. Yeah. Ambassador, and just to reiterate, you are telling uh, me you have not had a hard no on the light armoured vehicles from the New Zealand government yet. Look, I got I got a letter which kind of referred to what you referred to related to the maintenance. But my, my answer is very simple. Look, send them those. We can fix them. And that's a response. Okay, you know? so you're, t- you're saying we'll take the LAVs as is, where is, we'll put them to good use. Of course, of course. We'll fix them. I mean, they shouldn't, I don't think anybody should worry about maintenance. We'll, we'll figure it out. We're now getting Bushmasters, and we're figuring out how we're going to maintain them. We're getting M113s as also armored personnel carriers. Yep. Many other countries are sending. And we're getting, I think we might be getting some gloves as well uh, but from Britain or Canada. So if that's true, we can take some of this from New Zealand, and then, then we need to figure out how we, we maintain. But you think, I don't think we, you should worry about that. We, mm. we will figure it out. Ambassador, I for one would love to help, and I would love for New Zealand to do more for your country. I thank you so much for your time, and I wish you well. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.